that about 10 years ago when my kids came to me through my wife and asked me to come and tell them about my work. They were, uh, my son was in uh, elementary school back then. And I said, OK, what can I talk about? So I put together a very simple presentation that essentially evolved into those, in, in what's described in those uh, outlines about my STEM talks, yes, over the last 10 years. And for about five years or so, I'm volunteering with the STEM program in our company, the company, the Aerospace Corporation. And I developed a class about planetary defense, and I go and give talks at local schools from elementary to high school. And so for tonight, I prepared sort of like a, a hybrid version between the talk that I give at high school and the class that I give at Aerospace. It's kind of a little bit uh, above what I talk at the high school and a little bit below uh, what I talk in my class. So this is the outline of the talk. And I'm talking about basically asteroids and comets that might impact our planet and cause damage. And I'm describing why these are unique kind of threats. Um, and they are basically unique because the likelihood of us being impacted by one of these is very, very low. But the consequences could be severe. So it's one of those risk items that we are not typically used to, but we would like to pay attention to them to be prepared. Um, <clears throat> we are going to talk about how we discover them, uh, track them, catalog them, and so on and so forth. Uh, we're going to talk about what to do about them. If we discover an object that is headed away in the future, and we have, let's say, a number of months or years to be prepared, what would be the correct decision to take to defend our community and our planet from an impact by those objects? And once the decision is taken, what can we do in terms of technology? This is where STEM comes in, and orbital mechanics, and mathematics, and geometry. These are the kind of things that fall into the STEM topics that support the um, material that I'm going to show. <coughs> um, there is a, 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 a growing awareness at, uh, at the community and in the, in the government, both the US government and international uh, governments, in the need to develop methods to defend ourselves against those hazards. And so some of the uh, recommendations that come out of studies and conferences are that we need to develop tools and classes and talk just like that. And so this is why I go to classes, talk to the kids, you know, kind of get their mind rolling, plant a few seeds in their mind, and I'll show some of the examples later if I have a little bit of time. Um, and one of the things that is the highlight is a uh, NEO deflection app. NEO are the uh, acronym for uh, asteroids and comets that come near our planet, near Earth objects. And we developed uh, an, a program, a simulation, to deflect an asteroid that is headed away. It's typically appropriate for good high school students and college students. So good high school, school, good high, high school students could definitely understand the concept. They might not have the technical background. That's something they're going to acquire in college, typically in college. But they will understand what they can do. They can be a mission designer for the deflection of an asteroid that's headed that way. And that tool is found uh, on the NASA JPL public website for the public to try to, to, to use. It can be used in classes for projects and so on and so forth and it supports planetary defense conferences that are being held every other year where the experts are gathered together to talk about all of the aspects that are related to uh, planetary defense. And I'm one of the organizers of the conference. I participated in each one in the last uh, 10 years or so. And uh, the tool is used to support an exercise that is uh, carried out during the conference to simulate uh, what would happen if an object like this would be headed away? What could we do from the public uh, perspective, from the technological perspective, political, legal, 
consequences, disaster response, everybody gathers together and try to address what would we do under that type of uh, natural disaster. So let me move on. Uh, a quick uh, description of the issue is that these are near Earth objects, simply asteroids and comets that come near our planet. They orbit the sun just like we do, but in orbits they tend to sometimes intersect with the orbit of the Earth around the sun, and therefore they create a possibility of finding themselves in the same location at the same time, which means a collision. Okay? Uh, the probability is very small. The consequences could be very severe, and that's why we would like to pay attention to the issue. And that is the reason why it would be prudent to develop some, um, to be aware of, it, of, of, the, of the hazard and be prepared to address it if it, if it uh, materializes one day, uh, you know, if it presents itself one day. And so it would be prudent to be proactive with it. And that talk is part of raising awareness to the issue so that uh, people are aware about the resources that should be allocated to that type of threat, which is a fairly, fairly <coughs> recent type of threat. It did not exist up until about 20 years ago. I mean, the threat existed, but the awareness to the threat did not exist until fairly recently. Uh, a quick dictionary, what are these objects? Well, an asteroid is a relatively small piece of rock orbiting the sun, uh, probably originated from the remnant of the solar system. Um, and a comet is a similar object, also orbiting the sun, but at the outer skirts of the solar system. It's usually made out of a solid core covered by dust and ice. When it comes near the sun, the heat of the sun causes the material to evaporate, creates the big tail that is visible to us. And what we typically see in terms of the comets are the tails and not the objects themselves. A meteorite is just a small particle that broke off from the asteroid or the comet, and sometimes it just veers away, find itself in different locations, and could be find itself in our area. And meteor is a little bit of a misconception. Uh, some people think that the meteor is an object, but it isn't. It is just the light phenomena that uh, such an object exhibits upon entry through the atmosphere. Right? It passes at the humongous speed through the atmosphere, the friction causes it to heat up and break, and it, the light phenomena that we call a meteor. Do you know why it is called a meteor? Anybody has a guess? It's a Latin. It's a Latin. It was created by ancient Greeks because they didn't know anything about space objects and about rockets, and they thought it's just another meteor, meteorological phenomenon. So it's called it a meteor, something that doesn't get understood. And finally, if that object made it, make, makes it down to the ground, it is called a meteorite. And we actually have a few examples of this. Uh, I typically uh, pass those samples around class. This is a meteorite that fell in Russia, I think in the 1940s. And what I show the kids is that I take a magnet and I put it to the meteorite and ask them what it is made out of. So those that are interested in material science can try to guess what it is made out of, if you pass it around for me to touch. And these are objects I pass in each of my talks to the kids. Uh, here's an example of how, of how those orbits kind of look like. Uh, what you can see here is a typical orbit for a near-Earth asteroid. So it orbits the Sun just like we do. And it kind of come, comes close to the orbit of Earth, but not quite touches it. When it does intersect with it, it becomes what is called a potentially hazardous object, PHA, which means they have the possibility of finding themselves, I mean, the, the object and the Earth, finding themselves in the same location at the same time. That's a key thing to cause a collision, right? Every collision requires these two conditions. So let's look at some evidence of those impacts on our planet Earth. Today we are aware of about a couple of hundred uh, impact craters or impact evidence 
on planet Earth, about a couple of hours. You should remember that when you take a telescope and look at the moon, you see a lot more of those impact craters. And you can try to ask the question, why our planet is so pristine with very little evidence. And obviously, and I have a few slides on this at the talk that I give to the kids to show how geological activities tend to erase the evidence on Earth while it is preserved permanently on other moons and rocky objects. However, this is the only evidence for a person that got hit by one of these objects right here in Texas. In 1954, she survived and became famous through this picture. She didn't, uh, she wasn't killed. And if you may have followed the news in the last week or so, you may have heard that there was a report that the, the, first, the, cold, uh, the first person that was killed by a meteorite in India. Uh, some of the scientists are very skeptical about this. So uh, I haven't seen the final conclusion, but it kind of, I think, it tilts towards sort of like a uh, misconception. But that's, this is real. Uh, this is the first person that is not really hit by one of these objects. Another interesting story is this clay tablet that was discovered from the time of the Sumerians. The Sumerians were known uh, to be the, um, avid astronomers. They used to record the night sky on those clay tablets. And there are many of them in the British Museum and some other museums. And they were studied uh, to, um, you know, to understand what those ancient civilizations knew about uh, space. But there is one unique clay tablet, which is this, that contains an interesting series of dots. Sorry. And that is something that is not found in the night sky anywhere. So a couple of British scientists uh, took it to develop a computer program that takes the night sky as we know it today and simulate it backward in time to match it with what is observed on this clay tablet. And now they ask the question, well, if a Sumerian astronomer were sitting and seeing a meteorite or, an, or, or a comet you know, flying in sky, from his perspective, where would be uh, the impact location? And based on their calculations, it, it, it was a village in Austria by the name of Kofels. And they went to this village, and it turns out that there is one single mountain in the Austrian Alps that collapsed several thousand years ago without explanation regarding geological activities, earthquakes, or anything else. So they theorized that the mountain collapsed as a result of that meteorite hitting that mountain some thousands of years ago. But whether it's true or not, we don't know. We probably will never know. But it's an interesting story. It's plausible. As an example, that this object could cause that kind of damage, but uh, the dots on this scale tablet are quite interesting. Another example is a impact crater. An impact crater that was discovered in southern Iraq just a few years ago, about two miles wide, and dated to about 23 BC. It turns out that at that time there was a mass collapse of civilizations in the Fertile Crescent area, and mass migration from this region towards Egypt, where food actually did exist. And it was kind of unexplainable why those civilizations collapsed without any apparent reason. So the current theory says that that impact must have ignited huge brush fires that disrupted the food supply of those civilizations, and they simply collapsed because of lack of resources because of disruption of the system. So this is an example how civilizations could be impacted by those objects. But a much more vivid example is meteor crater in our neighboring state of Arizona. Any of you heard of it, been there, visited? Very good. Uh, I took my family there. We spent half a day there. And in fact, we held one of the conferences right in this location, and we're given a tour down to the bottom of the crater by a renowned geologist to study the meteor crater. Fascinating place. I recommend field trips to there. We have a fantastic uh, visitor center with big objects that came from space and explanations. Very, very educational uh, experience. And what 
I have done when I was there is that I bought a piece of rock from the edge of the crater. So it is just a piece of rock, you wouldn't even notice it if you go to this region. But I show the kids, if you take a magnet and put it to this piece of rock, it is magnetic. It contains iron, right? And it was taken right from the edge of the crater. If you were to collect pieces of rock from further out, they would not be uh, magnetic. They would not contain the iron that this piece uh, uh, contains. And so this is an example from a piece of rock from the edge of the meteor crater. The size of the asteroid was about 30 to 50 meters in diameter, but the impact created that crater, which is almost a mile wide. It kind of tells you something about the energy that these objects embed into them. Humongous amount of energy. So uh, the reason why those craters always look circular, anybody knows why they don't look elongated? Because most of the objects don't come from above, right? They come at an angle, but the craters are always circular. And the reason is because once the energy is converted to an explosion, it becomes a scalar. And the scalar just causes a circular uh, crater because the energy is spreading uh, in each direction even. Okay. Another famous uh, event occurred in the year 1908 in Tunguska, Siberia where an object exploded very up high in the sky and caused a huge swath of the forest to burn down with the trees falling away from the direction, from, from the epicenter. They, they say that perhaps two people may have been killed, but nobody really knows because it was in a very remote area. And that picture was taken about 15 years later when the Soviet government sent an expedition to the area to study what in the world happened there. That was before the age of rockets and big bombs, right? And that's what they saw. The size of the forest that burned is bigger than Washington, D.C. and is about the size of New York City. If that explosion had occurred over these cities, they would be destroyed instantaneously. And so that is the source of the concern from those cosmic hazards. We don't want to have our capital being destroyed by a relatively small object, just about 30 to 40 meters in diameter. That is a very small object. So uh, when the information started flowing about those objects possibly hitting us, the awareness started to grow and the realization that we have to do something about this hazard. If that object had arrived just three hours later, just because of the rotation of our planet Earth, it would have destroyed Moscow. And today Moscow is the capital of a major country with about 11 and a half million inhabitants. It would be burned down to the ground instantaneously. It's a concern. So that's the att attention that is given to uh, those objects. You may remember that about three years ago there was an explosion over Russia. Do you remember that? So that is another evidence of events that could take place here. And let's see if this will really work here. It came from outer space, <laughs> searing the sky over a densely populated Russian city. I went to the window, I looked outside, and I saw this giant streak across the sky. It was so bright, it was blind, and I had to look down. A white hot fireball, <laughs> as big as a building, weighing 10,000 tons, headed for Earth. People had no idea what was bouncing here. <laughs>
outer space, searing the sky over a densely populated Russian city. I went to the window, I looked outside, and it was this giant streak across the sky. It was so bright, it was blinding, and I had to look at it. A white hot fireball, as big as a building, weighing 10,000 tons, headed for Earth. People had no idea what was found in here. My first reaction was, this is the big one. Probably something bigger than we ever expected to see in our lifetimes. This is a once in a century event. It's the biggest recorded meteor strike since 1908, when another monster from space flattened 800 square miles of Siberian forest. But unlike that blast, which took place in an isolated wilderness, this meteor is witnessed by a multitude of stunned onlookers. Captured in frightening detail by dozens of digital cameras. We've got a unique event taking place in an environment in which people have filmed it extensively. It's absolutely incredible. It's going to be a huge bounty to sight. Now the race is on to find out what really happened. Through unprecedented video evidence, dramatic eyewitness accounts. I had never seen anything like that before in my life. And new clues on the ground. Across a farm, exploded in the atmosphere, and here I am pulling it in my hand. Scientists piece together the complete story of the blast heard around the world and the even bigger disaster that could have been. When something going that fast slams into even really thin air, there's tremendous forces on it. The atomic bomb drop from Hiroshima was about 15 to 20,000 tons of TNT. This is about 20 to 30 times that event. Will we be this lucky again? Is there any way to predict the next meteor strike right now on Nova? I'm going to stop it here. This is about an hour long Nova program that I recommend to go and watch. It gives a lot of information about the, this event and how the trajectories were, uh, were uh, uh, kind of estimated for the dash cams of many, many cars and many, many security uh, cameras. Very, very interesting program that I recommend to watch. So let's see if I can go back to... information that became available to us fairly recently is this map of um, uh, explosions in the atmosphere taken by American satellites that were designed to gather information about what's going on in other countries and so on and so forth. And they found that over a couple of decades there were about 500 explosions in the sky over the globe which were not man-made. These were explosions that are natural. They're cured by some of these space objects entering. So when they looked at this map, they say, are we underestimating the threat? Probably. And so as a result of that, just very recently, I think about a month ago or so, NASA officially created a program office for uh, planetary defense, for asteroid detection hazard, and Mitigation. So they were already they are already busy over a couple of decades trying to find those objects before they find us. Right? That's our goal to find them before they find us. Right? But once we found an object, and it's just a question of when, that might be headed our way. What do we do about it? What can we do about it? That's the subject of our step. Um, well. Basically, if we want to describe in a nutshell what is the description of the risk, we want to take something which is an uncontrolled risk, like the situation we are in today, and reduce the risk to a comfortable level, to a convenient level. So if there is a risk of being impacted by an object of one in 100 or one in 50 that can kill perhaps thousands or 
more, we would like to take actions that will reduce the risk of collision. This is the purpose of the mitigation, or one aspect of the mitigation of the problem. Um, we need to remind ourselves that each and every one of these objects orbits the sun probably thousands, if not millions of times before it impacts us. So it exists out there for us to try to find it with telescopes, and there is something that's called the Space Guard FO. It's a collection of international, amateur, professional, government-run telescopes that is interconnected and is used to, the, to uh, find suspect objects. And when one is found, it is being distributed globally, and it is either confirmed or ruled out as a potentially hazardous object. Um, why is it important to do that? Because if we find an object early, as, as you know, early detection is always something good. If we find them early, we may be able to characterize them. How large they are? Are they made out of iron or just pile of rubble? Or are they spinning? Can we send a mission and deflect them? All this is uh, all important information that is really critical for us to know if we can. And so the critical uh, element that we have to put in place to be able to characterize them is to find them early. That's the current, the majority of the current effort is to try to find those objects as early as possible. And another piece of information is that in the old days they thought that only the very big ones that can kill dinosaurs are the ones that need attention. But those recent explosions that occurred over those Russian cities and in Iraq, so even small objects are dangerous in terms of regional or local communities. And we don't want to lose the capital or a highly urban area because we miss one of these small objects. Right? So that's where the majority of the discovery are from. But this is some of the information we would like to discuss. We would like to learn about these objects to be able to design a mission to deflect the asteroid. How many are uh, in existence today? This is a fairly recent map of the uh, discovery rate. We divide those objects into the really, really big ones, the very rare objects, larger than a kilometer, and the rest of them. Today, NASA claims that the large ones that are marked in red are mostly discovered, they have mostly been discovered, because the rate of discovery is tapering off. You can see that there was a time in the 90s, late 90s and early 2000s, where the rate of discovery of the big ones was ramping up, but fairly recently it slowed down, which leads us to conclude we have found the majority of them. NASA says 92, 93% are not ones. These are the ones that can cause really, really global damage. But look at the rate of discovery of the small ones. It's accelerating. And it's accelerating simply because we are devoting more resources for their discoveries. Maybe in a decade or two, we might be able to see this blue curve kind of uh, tapering off and becoming stable. And we'll say, yeah, we found maybe 90% of the medium and small ones. But we are now really at the age of discovery of those objects. Anybody who wants to be an astronomer, a stargazer, he has something to do with it, right? <laughs> so a couple of years ago, I think it was a couple of years ago, my wife came to me and says, I heard in the radio that there's a few of these little objects that come very close to our planet, all in a very short period of time. I said, you know what, let's go visit this JPM NASA website. And sure enough, within the course of a couple of days, there were several objects that came close, closer than the distance to the moon. So when those objects come closer than the distance to the moon, it is considered to be very close. <laughs> very, very close. <laughs> and so here is several objects about the Tunguska class object and the Chelyabinsk, the Russian from three years ago class object, all within less than the distance to the moon within a course of two days. And so something that I do sometimes in the high school or in the classes is we go and visit that website here 
and see what's going on there live. Let's see what's going on around our planet right this minute. So I'm going to click on this uh, link here. And I think I have to quit my presentation again to, for us to see what's going on there. Okay, so this is the NASA website here that you, can, you are welcome to go and visit. And it contains two interesting tables. This is a table of the recent close approaches to our planet. So uh, here's today. And you can see here that there were several objects that passed near our planet, passing in fact today. Some of them are quite large. If an object like this would impact us, it would cause a significant damage, a very significant damage. Luckily, it passed at around 60 lunar distances from us. Here is an object about the size of the Tunguska that passed at 8 lunar distances. Uh, here is an object <coughs> the size of uh, the Chelyabins from three years ago at about 6. And now if we move down to what's coming, so tomorrow, here is a couple of good sized ones. Um, here is one that is going to pass few days from now, and so on and so forth. You can see that there are some of these objects are fairly close, some of them are, are fairly large. Here is a one kilometer almost object that is going to pass at the end of the month. We are kind of in a shooting gallery. You can see that? So, and this is the reality in which we live. Uh, uh, fortunately, we were not hit by any of these objects today, and we are not projected to be hit by them anytime soon but they are keep being discovered, and we need to be aware of those objects. <clears throat> oh, question. Yes. Do they have any sort of designation? Those are all NEOs? Yes. Right? Is there any designation like for a PHA? Yes, there is. Uh, it's in one of the charts, and maybe later we'll come back and show you the designation. But, right? but there is a definition of how close an object to Earth is defined as near Earth object, and how close it is is defined as potentially as others. Yeah, these are very clear. But let's let's go. Let's come back to it later, just in the benefit of time. So <clears throat> we just saw live what's going on around our planet. It's a table you can visit at any time. It's on JPL's website. And what I've done, in fact, earlier today, before they updated this table, it's been it's been updated daily. I took a snapshot. And here is an object that passed just 0.2 lunar distances from us. It's almost at the, at the altitude of the satellites. Almost. Right? So I think this is really telling that some of these objects can come very, very close to us. Right? This is just a few days ago, 12 and 13. Three lunar distances and so on and so forth. So I just took this snapshot. And that's another snapshot of what's coming and some of these shifted to the other table in in the continuously updating table. And a few uh, couple of months ago I was looking at the table and I saw this object. Have you heard about the Halloween, the pumpkin asteroid that passed near us? Some of you did. That was a very large one, about 600 meters. Uh, passing at about one lunar distance away from us at a very, very high speed. So that is really one of these objects that could change the world. If it had hit us, we probably would not be sitting here today. It would really cause uh, continental disruption. So it's not the kind of thing I show to the kids, especially not the mid middle class in the, small, the, the elementary schools, <laughs> and even not to the high schools, typically not, unless they ask me specific questions, they're very, very interested, and they so show that they are, you know, mature enough to understand what this tells us, but it's a serious problem. And we would like to inspire the next generation of, you know, scientists and engineers to engage with these kind of activities that can change the world. So what I've done, to just give the context of the order of my I took my little pocket camera and went up on Kenneth Hunt Park. 
if you know what it is, and I took a shot of downtown LA and said, what if this asteroid would hit impact downtown LA? That's how what we look at the moment of impact. I think it's impressive. <laughs> Not much would be left from downtown LA or several hundred kilometers away from downtown LA. It's a serious matter. It's a real object. We are very lucky that it was missing us by just one uh, lunar distance. But you look at this table, and the table is updated every day. There is about quarter million objects that are known to us today. And so we need to be prepared. So this guy put together this very interesting object um, video. Let's see if I can oh, okay. make the presentation what I think. I think that's a very interesting. Okay, before I play it, I will escape here. Okay. Hello, this is Scott Manley, and I'd like to talk you through this video I created showing the rate of discovery of asteroids for the last 30 years or so, starting in 1980. Now, what you see here is a top-down view of the inner solar system with four planets in the middle, and on the edges you can see Jupiter. What you also see is a large number of green, yellow, and red spots denoting the position of asteroids. The colouring is primarily to indicate how close they can come to the Earth. Green are main belt asteroids, yellow cross the orbit of Mars, and red cross the orbit of Earth. Also, as asteroids are discovered, we flash them white to make them more obvious. Now, if you look in the bottom left, there are two numbers. The first is the year, and the second is the number of asteroids known on that date. Now, you can see this number grows as more objects were discovered by astronomers. In addition, the highlighting of the discovery location lets you see patterns in the discovery process. The most obvious pattern is that most objects are being discovered opposite to the direction of the sun. And this, of course, makes total sense, since you're going to be looking for these things in nighttime skies. Sometimes you see a big flash of discoveries lined up with another planet. Scientists were perhaps looking for new moons around these planets, but found asteroids as well. In the 1980s, most imaging is being done with photographic plates, but by the time the mid-90s roll around, electronic imaging becomes the standard. This gives a significant increase to the discovery rates since the turnaround time for image processing and analysis gets much faster. When you're trying to discover objects moving across the night sky, it's very important that you follow up on the observations before the object moves too far and is lost. Now, by the late 90s, a number of dedicated asteroid discovery programs are in full flow. These combine electronic imaging with automated image processing and follow-up. Hundreds of new objects are being discovered every day, and new patterns of discovery become evident. If you watch, you can see the discovery rate pulsing roughly twice a second. This corresponds to the lunar cycle. During a full moon, it is harder to discover faint objects since the moonlight makes the background sky brighter. There's also a sparse dead spot around the 5 o'clock position. Apparently this corresponds to the cloudy season in Arizona where a number of these automated surveys are based. Now by mid-2000 we're starting to see hundreds of thousands of known objects and it's getting very crowded in the inner solar system. But you need to appreciate the distances here are huge. One pixel at the highest resolution is still 500,000 kilometers. So all those objects apparently buzzing the Earth are still a long way out. And now for a few seconds you're going to see the discovery pattern of WISE, the Wide Field Infrared Survey Explorer. That was a space telescope designed to image the entire sky in infrared. And so we're almost up to the present day and we have over half a million asteroids in our database. I'm Scott Manley, thanks for watching. That was the asteroid belt. The narration was over. So that was in 2012. Today we have about quarter, um, three quarters of a million of uh, millions of these objects by today. So they are there. They are being discovered continuously. 
maybe in 10 or 20 years we'll be able to say we discovered the majority of them, but we are still at the age of discovery of these objects. Okay, let's just move on. Okay. Okay, so let's say we discovered an asteroid. It's headed away with some uncertainty because when we discover them, we take very few measurements. We don't know, we don't know their orbit very precisely. And so there is a large measure of uncertainty about their location. And it is manifested by this big ellipse. You know? This is the ellipse in which Earth could be contained. And it tells us there is some probability that the asteroid might impact us sometime in the future. We need to keep tracking this asteroid and refine its orbit to the level that we can then either rule out a collision or determine that it's going to impact. So with more and more measurements, what we see here is that the level of uncertainty shrinks, and because Earth is still contained, the level of likelihood, the, re the level of likelihood rises over time. And it gains some concerns in the news or in the media, Yes, in 10 or 20 years, there's going to be an asteroid that has some likelihood of impacting us. We need to keep tracking, keep track the, the asteroid. And then, suddenly, the measurements typically simply shrink enough to rule out the collision, because now Earth is found outside of the region of uncertainty. And the likelihood drops to zero almost instantaneously. That is the biggest challenge for the decision maker. Are we going to act soon, launch our launch vehicles with big deflectors or bombs, and in all likelihood they will never, never be used, they will be criticized with wasting public money, right, <laughs> in order, or they will say, I'm going to be wise, I'm going to wait until I have better information, and I'm going to send it later only in the case where it's going to impact us, but it might be too late to respond and they will be criticized with not doing something, not doing it enough, early enough. That is the dilemma that decision makers are faced with this kind of threat today. In our organization, we are leading some of the effort, uh, organizing planetary defense conferences and workshops, giving classes and talks and so on and so forth. This is a person that's called Bill Ayer. Bill he is the founder of the area in our company. Uh, and basically he says, you know, if a threat would be manifested at a few weeks, months, or years, it changes the way we respond to it. Is it something that we set up a committee and decide what system to build, or is it something that requires us to pull all of our resources and respond to it very, very quickly, or maybe just issue a, a disaster response? That's what we want to do uh, in terms of technology, we would like to train uh, the next generation of rocket scientists that will be able to respond to the threat. This is the goal of our uh, effort. And how can we resolve it? There are basically, there are two ways to mitigate against those objects. Either deflect them away from an impact or blow them out of the sky. These are basically the two means that are available to us to do that. <coughs> In some cases, when the objects are, uh, have very short warning times, or they might be too large, we might have to resort to disaster response. Whatever it presents to us, we take it and deal with it. But if we can do something about it, we either deflect them or destroy them with big bombs. And how do we do it? We discover the object, and we have a period in which we try to refine its orbit. At some point in time, it's determined that the object is actually headed away. Something, we need to do something about it. So we decide to do something about it, we build the system, we launch it. The system <coughs> travels in space from Earth to the asteroid. It, that takes time. It's not instantaneous. And at some point, it deflects the asteroid. The asteroid is deflected maybe enough, maybe not. And at some point, we hopefully will be able to avert a disaster by deflecting enough. Our goal 
and the goal of every planetary defender, planetary defender in the future, would be to take this uh, blue zone here and expand it as much as they can to the left and to the right. Expanding it to the left means that you were able to detect them early, build the system early, launch them in time to build a big missed distance. And uh, expanding to the right, it means that you can deal with late coming objects, those that have very little warning time. Do we have the system to respond to an object that is large and discovered maybe just a few weeks before we impact? Right? This is the kind, this is our objective. So this is an example of the last uh, planetary defense conference that we held uh, last year in April in Italy. The next one will be in Japan in 2017. And actually it includes the student uh, projects. Uh, I'm not sure that we ever had from high schools, but why not? Uh, colleges do contribute and we have a student competition. And some of the students actually get a stipend to come attend the conference. So here's me in the middle here. And think about the next <laughs> conference. So in order to assist the conference, we developed an app. And, uh, Asteroid deflection application for NASA with NASA funding, and it solved the, prob the, the following problem. Here's the orbit of the Earth around the Sun, and here is the orbit of the near Earth object around the Sun. We would like to launch a launch vehicle to impact that asteroid and move it out of harm's way. This is the project that we have. And that uh, app is found online in this location, in this URL which you are welcome to uh, copy and, and go visit. I'm going to give a very quick demo of the app uh, by simply clicking on that page here and I guess quitting the... Okay, so this is the NASA page in which you can find wealth of information in each one of these tabs here about uh, near-Earth objects, and that's one place where you will find information about um, that application. I'm going to load it here onto the screen and see if we can see... Uh, okay. Alright, so I'm going to have to shrink it a little bit here so we can see what's going on. So what you see here is an interactive asteroid deflection mission design simulator. Anybody can have hands on. This is the control panel here. This is the distance between the asteroid and the Earth. These are the orbits. And you can select from a series of simulated asteroids. These are all fictitious objects that are invented and designed to impact with Earth and require some mitigation effort to move them out of the way. And so this is a, a 30 years worth of data uh, ending up in an impact at time zero at that location <coughs> right here. This is the location of impact. And we live in three dimensional space. We can push it forward or backward, up or down, uh, left and right. So uh, I'm going to show quickly how we can move it in one of the directions. And you can see that the simulator actually moved the asteroid from its impact location outside and we averted the disaster. Okay, one more thing that they are welcome to do is to switch to a mode where the launch vehicles are part of the picture. We can select a few launch vehicles here, but I'm not, I'm not going to go over this and I can give you a demo later. So let's just wrap it up in the simulation because I think I'm going to be killed soon. <laughs> the UCLA Meteorite Gallery right in this university. Uh, 
It's a nice little museum they put together here. It's worth a visit. And you can get to touch some space objects. And if you uh, show up during the weekend, some of the scientists of the center will actually uh, answer your questions. So bring in your class here and talk to the scientists for those that are interested in the material science of these objects. is very, very uh, um, recommended. I took my family there a couple of times to touch those objects and learn about what they're made out of. And this is a talk that I gave uh, in November about it to a uh, middle school. So there were 500 students <laughs> all the time. First time I gave a talk to <coughs> such a humongous amount of students. And it, I started to answer a few of the questions that obviously each of them had. Uh, and this is a thank you letter that I got from <coughs> one of the students from the talk that I gave last year. And I think what inspired me here is I cause them to think that they want to be astronauts. What else can I anticipate from the students that come and tell me, I will be an astronaut one day. I think I planted the seed in the mind of some of the students by giving them the talks. Not that talk, obviously, for all the participants. It's a much talk. I really inspire them. But, but I loved reading those thank you notes for the students. I guess I'm a nice person. So. And by that, I think I'm done. The conclusions are that this is a real threat to our safety. And it is a unique threat, kind of similar to volcanoes and super volcanoes and hurricanes and things like that. That we have, these, we have mitigation plans against those other disasters. We should have a means of protecting our community from the disasters of those other objects can, can create on our community. So with that, I think I up up. I hope that inspired you, inspired your students. If any questions, or so shoot me an email, or just ask me. Thank you.